I kind of often talk about the three P's, people, place, and purpose. And I think sheds offer a mix, and yeah. kind of an interchangeable mix of those things. Hello and welcome to another episode of the HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast. My name is Fergal Fox, and today we're talking about men's sheds. And with me today is Rebecca McLaughlin from the Irish Men's Sheds Association, and Ray Jordan from Furhouse Men's Shed in Dublin. Thanks very much for coming in. So, Ray, why did you get involved in the Men's Shed? Well, the main reason is um, I retired five years ago, and I knew once I retired that I need to be active to do something when I retire because I'm separated, so I live alone. So we know that just living alone isn't healthy in itself. And I had heard quite a bit about the sheds. My career was in bookbinding, so it was very practical making and repairing things and designing little jigs to do things. So I wanted access to a workshop to be able to be Very a bit more good. creative. Yeah. And I joined one shed and I stayed in it for a while and I ended up joining the fur house shed. But the fur house shed, unfortunately, is the shed without a shed because we use the community centre and the scout den in fur house area. You have two, two sheds, but two effective spaces. <laughs> two spaces, yeah, yeah. We don't have a physical shed with a workshop, which is what I wanted, but the camaraderie that is there in the four house mansion more than compensates for the lack of physical work that I like to do. And I can do it at home anyway, even though I live in an apartment. I have a micro workshop that I can do little things in. But the shed was wonderful. Um, as I say, for someone that's separated, living alone, you need fellowship with other people. You know, we're relational beings, as we know. So once I got into a shed and got to know people, there was no coming back. It was a lifeline for me, in other words. And was it difficult making that step into it? It can be an issue, all right. And like years ago, I wouldn't have done it. I would have considered myself to be extremely shy. Yeah. But you sort of grow out of that. I'm 71, so there's no point in being shy anymore. You know, you can leave all that behind. Very good. Um, so, yes, I looked around to see where there were sheds. And there are some sheds around, but there was none near me. I live in City West. So there was none sort of nearby that I could join that had a workshop that I could use. And it was through the first shed that I was in, we met some of the members of the Four House Shed while out walking. And one thing led to another. We got in introductions. And I heard that the Four House Men's Shed had an indoor bowling rinks. Okay. And I've always wanted to play bowls. Yeah. I used to live in Walkinstown and I used to travel through Crumlin Village going over to Rat Mines every week. And there's an outdoor bowling court in Crumlin Village. And I used to see it every week. And I thought, yeah, look at this. I'd love to try that. And I never got to try it. So I worked for 41 years. Then I retired. And this opportunity came up to try indoor bowls. And I've never looked back. And I've joined an actual club since Very good. getting into the shed and playing in the Four House Men's Shed. So back to the shed, we have a very active program, even though we don't have a workshop. And the men in the Four House Men's Shed don't particularly want a workshop. They must be all sort of ex-academics or civil servants or whatever. There's none that seem to want a particular workshop. And it's probably a little difficult given that we don't have an outbuilding yeah. or whatever to convert as many of the sheds have done. But there's an active program between indoor bowls, walking in the park three times a week, hill walking group. There's an art group as well. We do a lot of outings. You know, one a month, we're planning to go to the National Print Museum next week. Yeah, like your museums, uh, just to explain to the listeners, we're recording this podcast and Dr. Stevens and right before Ray came in to record, he said, is there any way I can get into the works library? And I was like, the works library, what's yeah, that? Yeah. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> but tell us about why that was so interesting to get in there, Ray. Why did you want to get access? Oh, well, the work library, yeah, it's an 18th century library. And when I worked in Trinity in the conservation department, we knew a lot of the academics who were interested in the history of bindings. And one particular guy, Nicholas Pickwold, was a specialist in the history of bindings. And he came over specifically to look at this collection because there are items in that collection that were bought off a bookseller back in the 17th century, were just put on a shelf in the library and they're still in their original purchase package, if you like. Right. And that's unique because once you buy a book from a book publisher or whomever, there's different ways you can be presented with the book. You don't just buy it in a binding. So you can get unbound copies of a book in sections and they are then given to a bookbinder to bind. 
And obviously, Edward Wart was a collector of these magnificent bindings. So some of what he has there never made it for a commission for a bookbinder to put a, a nice, detailed, decorative binding on it. Because you can see what was in the showcase. The Irish binding that we saw, beautifully filleted, um, roll around the edges, gold, probably gilt edges. And a bookbinder would have taken the original copies of the text, sewn it, put it together as a book, and then put a binding on it. And that's always fascinating to anyone that works, you know, as my yeah. career was, I say, book binding and then conservation. So we got a quick glimpse into the library right before we recorded this, and you've already set up with the, the library. The library yeah, yeah. She, she's ex-Trinity anyway, Elizabeth Ann Moran, yeah. You're going to bring the men's head group in there? I, I hope so, yeah. I will <laughs> ask, send in a request to Elizabeth and ask her, can she take a small group? Very good, very good. So you're always thinking about activities. Coming back to the shed, men need things to do. Yeah. So, Rebecca, I want to talk to you for a little minute about your work for the Irish Men's Sheds Association. You're supporting a network of sheds. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, so essentially my role is supporting what is already a health-inducing or promoting environment. Each shed is individual. It's as individual as the men. And we've just heard from Ray. It is a great privilege to learn from someone's life experience. I was completely not expecting to be transported into the 17th century there. But I'll be coming back into the library as well. But that's the opportunity in sheds, that it's men coming together at different stages. It could be post-retirement. They could be carers, the cared for, widows, people who are separated, guys who are on their own. People, the average age in a shed is about 65 but people with lots of different life experience and knowledge who come together, they form a committee. And currently, the sheds movement in Ireland is just a global phenomenon. So we have the highest number of men's sheds in Ireland. Well, why do you think that is? Do you think like Irish men? That's a very men, good question. <laughs> it's a million dollar question. <laughs> All men maybe, you know, have a reluctance around expressing mm. emotion or seeking that mm. social engagement, mm. whereas... Men's sheds in Ireland has become an acceptable norm mm. for social engagement. It has. And I think it's a very complicated one. I kind of often talk about the three P's, people, place and purpose. And I think sheds offer a mix and yeah. kind of an interchangeable mix of those things. And each shed is different. So it's really, really hard for us to be prescriptive about sheds. And it's very hard to generalize about them because of the diversity. So you can go into a shed down in Dingle and they're boat building yeah. or they've just been working on the famine graveyard down there. And you can go into a shed in Donegal and they're crafting spinning wheels. And I think no matter where you go, whether it's beekeeping, whether it's boat building, whether it's biodiversity projects, the two things all sheds have in common is connection and a kettle. The cup of tea is important yeah. in sheds. And I think men come in. <laughs> right. Ray, Ray's laughing. Yeah, he's laughing. But it's, yeah, it's it's. <laughs> you look up his hand here. You do what you want to share. <laughs> Go well, ahead, Just Ray. as Rebecca said, yeah. One of the first shed I joined was the Tallow Shed. And I got to know a few of the members there. And I remember talking to Jerry Finn, who was running the shed at the time. And he told us the story of a lady came down to the shed and said, Jerry, my husband's retired. He just sits in the sofa, sits in a chair all day long. Can't get him out. I'm trying to get him out. What do I do? What can I do? Can you help me out in any way? And he said, well, has he any pastimes, any hobbies? And she said, nothing. No, no, he doesn't do anything at all. Just sits there and reads the paper type of thing. And he said to her, does he drink tea? She said, yeah. He said, that's all he needs to be a member here. Send him down to the shed and... No, product, no CV needed. No CV needed, exactly, Fergal. And we did have there as well some young people that used to come down that had slight mental health problems. And they'd come in and they'd just sit there and they just wanted to hear the rest of us talk. They'd have a cup of tea and then they felt that they had enough to go. And they were very welcome. So, you know, there are no barriers in a shed. You know, people are welcome, come and go at whatever time scale they like themselves. I think it's very unusual at this day and age, really, to have a space where you can come in and you can leave whoever you are outside at the door. Because when you come into a shed, it doesn't matter what you do in the outside world or who you were. When you come in the doors of a shed, it's very democratic. It's you become a shedder. 
it's a non-judgmental space. People accept you for who you are. It's a very respectful space for the most part. There's, of course, there's Barneys and there's conflicts, but that's part of life as well. And it's sorted out. But in general, they're very vibrant hubs in communities like currently around Ireland there's about 400 sheds across the 26 counties there's 36 emerging sheds I've just come today from Tipperary and there was four new sheds there so how many sheds are in the network now do you? well there's 400 plus so we've 56 registered in Northern Ireland with us Right. We cut across the 26 counties and we're now looking to develop health and well-being, seeing how we can bring some of our health and well-being programs, specifically Sheds for Life, how we can adapt that and pilot that maybe with Sheds in Northern Ireland as well, because right. there's huge demand. They've heard about it. They've heard about it. Yeah, yeah so they've heard about it. <laughs> let's talk about Sheds for Life yeah. then, because you were talking about the process of a shed being kind of democratic and organic in a way and naturally health enhancing as a setting. Mm. But the Sheds for Life program, it's different. We're bringing in health inputs and, mm. and we're, we're sitting down with the men, asking them, you know, how are we going to put this program together to make it a bit tailored for them? Can you tell us a bit about what Sheds for Life looks like for a shed? And, and I know, Ray, you attended one of these, so I'm going to come to you in a minute. So Sheds for Life is really gender specific health and well-being intervention brought to the sheds directly into the sheds and brilliantly researched with Dr. Noel Richardson and Dr. Ashley McGrath and the learnings out of even the development of it and the piloting of it continue to inform how we strategically plan other projects and programs in terms of health and well-being. So all the work around talking to men about building programs with them, collaborative work and including men at every stage of the process of building a program. So Sheds for Life is a health and well-being program. It's a 10 week program and it dots around all our sheds. We run two programs a year in spring and autumn and it reaches about 400 to 500 men a year. We're just about to kick start it now in Cork. And we kind of work a year in advance. So we bookend the program with partners on the ground and our national partners. So we work with a whole map, if you like, uh, and scaffold of national partners, everybody from the Irish Heart Foundation to Diabetes Ireland. And we're continually refreshing that and reviewing it and seeing what men need at a particular moment in time that we can work with new partners to bring to them to provide more health and well-being supports. So they're doing things like physical activity. So they do. They have a choice of indoor yeah. out, outdoor exercise. Some of them are doing walk and football, activator poles. There's healthy food made easy. So they do six weeks of that which has been successful in unusual ways in that men are they're starting to read labels and shop in a more sustainable way. Doing the, a shop if they're living on their own and stuff like this, it's been men are saying it's been really, really, really useful, despite the fact there's competitions about who makes the best brown bread and stuff like this <laughs> as well. You know, The impact report highlighted that while there was no significant changes in the daily amounts of fruit and vegetables, there was significant and sustained improvement in cooking preparation techniques mm. as well as the cooking frequency. So yeah. they... Tips and tricks. Yeah, they were taking on the yeah. skills, Yeah, which is very impressive. Yeah. Ray, did you experience that one? Yes, because we did. The Four House Men Shed took part back in May 22. And we joined with the Knockline Men Shed because of numbers and we shared the experience over nine weeks and it was marvellous. Rebecca just said there was two ladies doing the Healthy Food Made Easy workshop and they came in, they laid out the table, they put all the ingredients on it and then they took us through the process of making a chicken wrap, uh, making actual making brown bread and a soup from scratch, just with the ingredients. And we went through that and everyone enjoyed it. I've loads of photos. Well, I do. I take photographs everywhere I go. But I've loads of photographs of it and everyone just smiling faces on everyone, just sitting there chopping onions, yeah. crying at the same time and doing all that. <laughs> Crying with happiness. Crying with happiness. There, there was very impressive outcomes, health outcomes, though, huge. like in terms of physical yeah. health, yeah, in terms yeah. of mental health, in terms huge, of like, it's just it's incredible. I think the core components. So everybody receives a visit from the Irish Heart Foundation van. So every man who takes part in the Sheds for Life program gets a heart health check. Even that in itself, every single program, something is picked up. Every single program. So I think it was in Headford Shed. We had a guy went straight from the shed into Galway and got a pacemaker. 
just recently in Sligo, we had a guy again, a heartbeat issue was picked up, went straight from the shed to the hospital. Significant risk. So stuff has been identified in the preventative part of the programme. But then the other work with partners and the self-selection piece is a really significant part of giving people a choice and some agency in how they manage their health. And it's a big, big part of Sheds for Life. So what we do is we give people taking part in Sheds for Life. Each shed gets a little menu of what organization they would like to come in to talk to them about a health and well-being topic that is relevant to men's health. So, for example, they might want to hear, you know, a talk about dementia awareness. They might want to hear a talk about prostate cancer, men's cancers. They can have a choice of hearing. We've introduced various talks this year. We've introduced actually oral health, a whole range of things. For all these stakeholders, yeah. you're giving them a hard to reach group in a settled setting. We are, but we also work really, really closely with the partners because we understand that it's not as simple as just going into a shed and delivering something. We don't do health to men. You'd be shown the door very quickly. So what we do is we do a lot of training, we do a lot of education and we have extensive stakeholder meetings. We do the engage training, which is brilliant for any facilitator going into a men's shed. And we do a little bespoke training as well. So that when people go into a shed, Our partners, they know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly. They've learned from other people who have been working in sheds so that it's mutually beneficial around. Really, everybody is going to get the maximum benefit out of the engagement of that person. But it shows the buy in of those partners as well, willing to go attend engage men's health training or or kind of get their gender response ready. So they're not just, yeah, yeah, as you said, going in doing it too. And they're powerful. I mean, there's, you know, you know, the Irish Hospice Foundation last year, we brought them in post COVID to deliver workshops on grief and loss. Yeah. And I sat in uh, because we all as part of the team, we dip in, dip out and we sit in on stuff so that we can keep track of stuff and see the response. And powerful stuff. And it's sometimes you're not trying to magically create wellness or make people healthy. What you are doing, it's, it's almost particularly with the workshops, you're dropping a pebble and you're creating a ripple effect. And sometimes some of these workshops can deepen conversations that might be already happening. But lots of conversations around health are not happening. And we know men because they will say themselves, we feel we are being stereotypically labeled that we don't do our health. But yeah. don't you know, we don't do well. The kind of retinue of men that we're dealing with have grown up believing the bad press about them. the bad press about <laughs> themselves. There's a lot of unwinding of perceptions and stereotypes that you have to do before you even go in there to deliver stuff, you know. So when I think about men attending sheds, I think about the vulnerability they're showing. And the social solidarity they're showing towards other men. You know, I think of the men in my life, brothers, father, uncles, you know, all these men. And we all need, I was saying before we came in, Ray, about, you know, you see a football team out in a pitch before the game kicks off and you see them all in this kind of big huddle and the arms around each other and that sense of physical solidarity before they go yeah. to war in a sure. game of football or whatever. But the shed seems to have that kind of invisible huddle for the members. It does. I, I, I totally agree with you. Now, obviously, we don't huddle yeah. in the four house men shed, but yeah, we're not, we're not afraid of giving each other a hug and uh, wrap our arms around the shoulder. Most of the men that I know in the four house shed, they don't like me. They'd be lost without it. It's a great benefit just to be in the presence of men, whether you say or do anything, it doesn't really matter. And because we're not creative, we do spend a lot of time just talking to one another. Like this morning, we had the exercise class. And that was part of the program and there is a manual on it and I can read out a definition of what it was all about. But we come together to enjoy sort of one, the exercise, two, the camaraderie and then the sort of fellowship with the tea and the coffee afterwards. And then there's always one or two wise acres who tell you how to solve all the problems in the world and crack a few jokes and that. Yeah. So it's definitely a tonic for a huge oh, I think so. demand. I think so. Yeah. And going back to the health issue. You know, the workshops we had in the program was there was a diabetes workshop, cancer workshop and a mental health workshop, along with the Irish Heart Foundation checking us all out. And I think each and every one of us benefited from all of that. I'll give you one example. 
in terms of the cancer workshop. One of our members had prostate cancer, well, probably a few of them. But he gave a talk about it to us in the shed. Really? And he did, yeah. And he did, he went down, there was, Rebecca knows the program in more detail, but it was a specific program to deal with prostate cancer very clearly. And he went through the gory details. And he was typically, because he's like most men, he thought, well, it's not going to happen to me. Yeah. And we all feel like that, you know, no major health issue is going to arise. But it did arise in his case. He got himself checked out and he went through the whole detail of what happened from the diagnosis through how he dealt with it on a day-to-day basis right to the end. And that was very informative for each and every one of us that sort of heard that. My doctor told me, he says, yeah, one in two men can get cancer, prostate cancer, over the age of 70. So here am I thinking I'm 71, yeah. What's coming down the road? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you, you're made more aware of it. A lot of the time, men just, we, we dismiss the fact that their health issues are sort of coming we'll at us. to the back of our minds. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Whereas when you meet in a group in a shed like that, and you meet someone specifically that had it, it's more, much easier for me to go to you, Ferg, and say, well, you had this issue. I'm worried about it. Tell me a little about it. What should I do? And, you know, and that's that's the kind of thing that can happen in the shed. Yeah. People will open up and talk. Now, they won't do it necessarily in a group forum, but they can do it on a one-to-one basis as you get to know people. Yeah, that seems so powerful. I want to ask you, Rebecca, about one of the other things that I've witnessed in some of the sheds. And it's like they're doing activities in the community. They're coming together mm. in their invisible huddle or not a physical huddle, but they're coming together in their shed to do their thing. But they're doing things that are positive for the community. Yeah. So it seems to be kind of creating this virtuous cycle of yeah. well-being. It's taken the shed setting, the community setting, and it's all coming back. Yeah. And I think sheds are powerful. There are spaces for positive aging and all that we associate with how to grow old or how to grow older. So there's always opportunity for growth. And even kind of we were talking about neuroscience earlier, our brain may change. And while there might be certain losses, there's also great gains as you grow older. And that's backed up by neuroscience, your brain's plasticity. We become better at making connections, at joining dots. You know, we're much better looking backwards because we're able to join all the dots and life experiences and everything. So I think they provide opportunities in communities for positive aging. So you can go in and you can contribute on your own terms. If you want to, you know, make stuff, if you want to, you know, create stuff in a garden, you've guys making honey, you've guys keeping bees, you've guys doing horticulture, you've guys selling stuff, you have guys, you know, in community gardens. So yeah, the great TG4 series. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, just the diversity of what happens in a shed yeah. is extraordinary. And the contribution they make, sheds are, are really committed to contributing to the communities that they live in. There's a lovely Italian, uh, now I'm going to mess up this uh, thing, called Campanellissimo. And it basically means in the shadow of the bell tower. So sheds work on the loyalty is to the shed. You know, it's in the shadow of the bell tower. And you do find that while sheds are great networkers, they'll get together. And for sheds for life, we often invite a hub shed to gather in sheds who might have decreased numbers and stuff like that so that they can be a host for the program. But there's fierce loyalty in sheds, you know, and there's fierce loyalty to communities and to making a difference. But that's very empowering. You know, the average age of a man in a shed is 65. Now, having said that, you can get anything from 20 to 101. I met a guy who was 101 in Sligo in a shed who took part in (laughs) Sheds for Life. He's our oldest participant in Sheds for Life and everything in between. Yeah. And the impact, I guess, you know, like we're looking at it in terms of our men's health plan. Sheds for Life is an explicit part of the the men's health plan and working with the Irish Men's Sheds Association. but. Beyond men's health, you know, yeah. you've seen women organizing themselves in community groups and through the ICA or some women have set up women's sheds now. But these men's sheds also have an impact on the families of those men, which inevitably are lots of women. Yes, no more totally. than the woman that, that you were telling us yeah. earlier about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, her husband had retired. Yeah, yeah. she wanted him to do something. And the shed was a great sort of forum for him to find something that's recreational and, you know, just beneficial to his well-being instead of having to stay at home and worry, oh, what do I do when I retire? Because when I was an apprentice, bookbinder in a printing house on, on Bachelor's Walk, I remember one of the, the rulers, the rulers were those that made up the account books, put all these rulings. It was all done by hand kind of thing on a, a pen ruling machine. And he died within six months of retiring because 
his work was his life. Yeah. And back then, obviously, in the, in the early 70s and whenever, there was less programs for people to be active when they retired. I think there's something, though, isn't there, about learning how to grow older when you are young that I think you need to have around you positive role models. I mean, I was very lucky. I had uh, I thought everybody's granny lived with them because my, my mother's mother lived with us yeah. growing up. So I, I just presumed everybody's granny kind of lived there, you know. So, But looking back on that, I had a really positive role model for that. And my granny was, she was always, she was a maker. She was, she was doing Irish crochet and stuff like this. And on the other side, I also had a grandmother who took up painting. All these powerful women, actually. Um, <laughs> but um, another granny who took up in her late 70s, I think, took up painting. So continually growing. And lifelong learning. Lifelong, lifelong learning. Engaging. One of yeah. the points that you made, Ray, there is about that transition into retirement. I heard somebody on the radio today joking about, because it's so well understood that that transition is difficult and people struggle. Yes, you're heading into the unknown. You're when heading you into retire. the unknown. But as you say, Rebecca, like thinking about it or planning for it or having a place like a shed to offer that social support yeah. so that transition isn't like hitting a sure. brick wall. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you seem to have kind of planned for that. Right? Uh, well, thankfully, when working in Trinity, they did a pre-retirement course yeah. for us as we came up to retiring. And that was very, very helpful. It just made you aware of the fact you need to find something to do when you retire. You're not going to be getting up early in the morning and going into your work and coming home at five o'clock. So it just makes people aware that one your lifestyle is going to change. You're not going to be working anymore now unless you have your own little business and you can do whatever. But most people just retire and then they're faced with the fact that I need to do something. What do I do? Now, some people might be golfers and they, they play their golf and they continue on doing the likes of that. But most people, if they haven't prepared or they haven't thought about it, you know, they're up against a brick wall. The sheds provide, you know, it's an ideal opportunity to become active in different ways. And you will meet people in the sheds. Like, as I said, I got introduced to the bowls, indoor bowling. Yeah. And I've also played outdoor bowling in a couple of clubs, being in the, the other sort of association. I mean, it's the Trinity Retirement Association. So they're active. So it's great when you are part of a, a body that has a retirement association because, again, the committee do things for you and you just turn up and go on these things. But for most people that don't have that, going into a shed, they, they will find fulfillment of one sort or another once they join a shed. Because you will. We've over 70 members on our books 62 are fully paid up past year. And of that core, about half of them are active all the time. So some that they're happy to be in the shed. They won't always turn up every week for all the different activities we have. Some, you know, we have pitch and put on a Wednesday and only sort of seven or eight, nine members play in that. And they don't necessarily join the other activities. So this is always something there. There's something nice about being able to engage with something on your own terms and at your own pace, exactly. you know, yeah. and I think that's a big yeah. piece with sheds yeah. that nobody is forcing you to do anything. It's kind of an open invitation and you can take part however you wish yeah. and you can contribute in yeah. whatever you wish. And you do see amazing skills being shared. So you see guys coming in with all kinds of skills. Yeah, that was the other thing that I was saying to you, Rebecca. I'm very impressed with the conglomerate of skills that comes in there. Well, there is a social mix. There is a lot of former professionals. You said there earlier on about, you know, you wanted to keep your handiwork or your... Yes, your, yeah, be creative. Being yeah, creative. Yeah, like yeah. you thought, okay, that's my strength. It's definitely something I want. I must compliment you on your pre-retirement plan and you really engaged with that. Like, I, I think that's, that's a great message for yeah. everybody, yeah. Uh, men and yeah. women, just to reflect. And it's never too early, Rebecca. No, it's <laughs> never too early. People come to sheds and they could be, it could be retirement. They could be caring for somebody at home. They could be widowed. Yes. You know, we do see men encountering and negotiating different life challenges yeah. and stages when they come to sheds. If we knew the magic formula, there's something about sheds that is able to contain that and hold people. I'm often struck there is a sense of kind of the the therapeutic space about sheds sometimes you can yeah. come in and what's said in the shed stays in the shed you know people have your back yeah you know and you're it's safe you can say things to other people you can find support about different things that's quite unusual to find a space like this you yeah. know no, in, no, in, you know there's something very it's not surprising there's such a huge hit yeah. in society you know why wouldn't a space like that be a huge 
Plus, we have to create more of them and, and support them that are there. In terms of the listeners, to find out more, can you tell us a bit better about your website and your newsletter? Because I find your newsletter gives a lot of stories. Yeah, so we're the umbrella yeah. for the Sheds. So Sheds for Life would be our flagship health and wellbeing programme. But obviously we have lots of other national programmes. We have uh, other health and wellbeing programmes that Sheds engage with us on. And obviously we engage with lots and other health and wellbeing events and initiatives throughout the year. So International Men's Day is coming up where it's also coincided with our conference. Men's Week is obviously a huge thing for us as well. So people can find out about us on the web. Just look us up, Irish Men's Sheds. And specifically for health and wellbeing, they can get onto the health and wellbeing team, our little merry band of people. But we spend a lot of time out on the road. And that is a big part. I mean, as I said, I've just come from Tipperary. But that's important because we feel if, if you're not out on the road, and listening and hearing what men really need and what the issues are on the ground, it's hard to plan for upcoming health and well-being initiatives and to keep improving the offering, which is what we're always trying to do. But there's lots of lovely initiatives. You know, we have a, a fantastic Daffodil Bench campaign with the Irish Cancer Society and, and local authorities. That's expanding. I'm mean, hoping there's going to be about 50 of those by the end of this year. And Sheds are actively involved in painting the benches. There is a bench contributed by a local authority. We match a shed and they put a QR code and the QR code when scanned gives access to the local cancer supports and services signposting to that, but also to the local men's shed. So it's a lovely win-win. So yeah. so those kind of community engagement pieces and health and well-being pieces are really important. And it opens opportunities up for more sheds to engage. Anybody can join a shed. There's an open invitation for men to join a shed. And there's plenty of them around. It may be a case that the shed on your road might not be the best match for you. But to be sure, there'll be one in the next village or two villages over which might suit you better, depending on your interests yeah. and depending what you're interested in doing. OK, well, look, at, I'd like to really thank you so much for coming in and telling us all that stuff, Rebecca and Ray. I really appreciate your time. You're very welcome. So if you know anyone that might be interested in Men's Sheds, please share this podcast with them. Or if you've listened to any of our episodes that you found interesting, please share with a friend, family member or work colleague. We'd really appreciate that. And thanks again for listening to HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing. <laughs>